So as we get into part four of the Infinity Gauntlet storyline, we're going to uh, be seeing this comic unfolding from the perspective of Eros. And again, Eros is the brother of Thanos, and Eros is, has, his, uh, has had his ability to speak removed. But he's simply going to be telling us more or less, uh, you know, throughout his thoughts, what it is that's going on here, what it is that's taking place. What we're also going to be seeing here is, for the most part, an absolute slaughter. We're going to be seeing the uh, Earthbound superheroes really not being able to do anything to oppose the power of Thanos. But the things that he does to them, the way that he chooses to defeat them, I think are very interesting. And if this sort of story plays out in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, if Marvel is truly going the direction of the Infinity Gauntlet, then I think for the most part, with the exception of characters like Cyclops and Silver Surfer being interchanged with other characters, that we'll see this story unfolding in such a way to where it will be very intriguing and a very rich uh, sort of conflict. And what we see happening as the comic opens up is that Earthbound, uh, the Earthbound superheroes are at the Shrine of Mistress Death. They have arrived at Thanos' location to begin the conflict, but Thanos has used the time gem to freeze time completely. The only people who were not affected by the uh, freezing of time is Mephisto, Mistress Death, Nebula, Taraxia, who of course was a creation of Thanos, and uh, the Watcher and Eros. And what Thanos does here, what he uh, sort of comments on is is the fact that if this is the force that the superheroes were able to muster together, then he's really not too concerned. He could simply use his reality gem and just blink them out of existence entirely. And what we see um, uh, Mephisto saying is that there are other individuals with which Thanos should concern himself with. That Thanos should concern himself with the Silver Surfer and with Adam Warlock. And Thanos remarks by saying that these two individuals uh, appear to be the only two individuals who were intelligent enough to not challenge his omnipotence. And I would like you guys to pay very close attention here because, again, this is Thanos demonstrating a vast amount of arrogance. Thanos, while he's normally level-headed and extremely intelligent, ruthless, and cunning, seems to have run away with the ability that he has, seems to have run away with his power. And he's more or less being governed by arrogance and the belief of absolute power rather than thinking rationally and simply just ending the conflict to ensure his absolute victory. Now, what we also see Mephisto doing here is something very interesting, something very intriguing. Mephisto tells Thanos to stay his hand, to not kill Adam Warlock and the Silver Surfer. In addition, what he says is that this may be a uh, an opportunity in disguise. Thanos asks Mephisto to continue, and what Mephisto says is that Lady Death, Mistress Death, just like any other woman, has her heart warmed by courage, despite the fact that her heart is cold. She may find that because Thanos is willing to be courageous, that she is going to, uh, she may find herself more attracted to him than she previously did. And the question Thanos has is, how do I demonstrate this courage? How can I demonstrate the fact that I'm courageous when I'm going against forces that have no ability to stop me? And what Mephisto says is to not use the complete power of the gauntlet, to more or less use a portion of the power that the gauntlet has, to allow these superheroes a chance of victory. And if they are victorious, then he will die in the face of courage and he will earn the heart of Mistress Death, or he will fight and win the conflict with everything he has, thereby continuing to demonstrate courage and winning the heart of Mistress Death. And that because Thanos has so much power, that this is not something that's outside of his ability to control. This element, this uh, idea immediately uh, uh, rings a tone with Thanos. Thanos latches onto it and believes that this may very well be the case. And we see Eros commenting on this. Eros says that this is very strange, this is very weird, that for the most part, Mephisto just allowed the Earthbound superheroes the slightest chance for victory. However small, however unlikely it may be, they stand more of a chance now than they ever did before. And so he's more or less trying to figure out what kind of game Mephisto is playing here, what it is that he's doing. And so what we see Thanos doing is unfreezing time. Thanos, uh, for the most part, allows the conflict to continue using own the power gem. Now, the other thing here is that Eros uh, sees that somebody is standing over him. And when he looks up, he realizes that it's only Nebula. Now, Nebula is someone I would like you to keep in the back of your head because Nebula will become extremely important in the Infinity Gauntlet storyline. But as the story continues, as things move forward again, Thanos says that he's only going 
to use his power gem and that the power gem should allow him whatever it is that he needs to do. It will augment the existing abilities that he has to the point where he will still be able to defeat the uh, earthbound superheroes. And so what Thanos does is he snaps his fingers and time continues. From here we see that uh, Namor the Submariner and various other superheroes who were on a collision course with the shrine continue along the path that they were previously on and various things are destroyed. But what we see as this story continues is that for the most part, this, uh, this belief in the possibility of victory goes away very, very fast. And the reason why is because we see the Incredible Hulk using the full power at his disposal, as angry as he can possibly get, and attempting to punch Thanos, attempting to assault Thanos. But Thanos here appears to maybe make himself extremely large, make him uh, take on some sort of mass, and he's able to, for the most part, overpower the Incredible Hulk, or at the very least, push him away. But we see that the actions of the Incredible Hulk were a diversion in order for the Vision to sneak up behind Thanos and attempt to defeat him. But the power that uh, the Vision has is not enough for uh, Thanos to be defeated. He really doesn't do much here. He simply just uh, kind of shoots an energy beam at Thanos, but that's pretty much it. And again, we see Eros continuing to uh, comment here saying that this strategy was flawlessly executed, that this strategy was absolutely perfect, and that a lesser foe, anyone other than Thanos, would have been defeated here. But in the end, they're fighting Thanos. And even if Thanos were not using the Infinity Gauntlet, he would still be able to withstand the power of this attack due to the vast power that Thanos has. Thanos goes on to comment and say that he never would have expected this kind of an attack. This actually took him by surprise. And again, we see Eros also commenting, saying that Captain America is leading the charge, which is the reason why a lot of these attacks are so well coordinated. We see Captain America commenting and saying to continue on relentlessly uh, trying to overpower Thanos, to continue trying to do what they can to, uh, to defeat Thanos. But again, we switch back to Eros here. And Eros continues to comment and say that these hopes are vain. The possibility of defeating Thanos is simply just something that can't be done. And that for the most part, he's awestruck by the fact that in the face of almost guaranteed victory, that the Earthbound superheroes continue. At this point, we switch over to Adam Warlock and the Silver Surfer. And Adam Warlock asks the Silver Surfer how the conflict is going. And the Silver Surfer says it's going exactly as expected, which of course means that they simply didn't expect these superheroes to be very successful. And the Silver Surfer says that he should be there with them. He should be fighting alongside them. And Adam Warlock says this would be utter folly. And the reason why he says was this would be folly is because the Silver Surfer has a vast and important role that he is supposed to play here. But Adam Warlock won't tell the Silver Surfer what it is, because if the Silver Surfer knows what it is, Thanos could read the Silver Surfer's mind and prepare himself for the attack. But when Silver Surfer asks uh, Adam Warlock whether or not this is something that he should concern himself with, that Thanos may read his mind, Adam Warlock replies by saying that this is not something that Thanos would do. Now, the whole reason why is something that's not not necessarily explained to us in this issue, but in previous issues, and especially uh, the ongoing series right now regarding uh, Adam Warlock and Thanos um, in the Marvel, uh, the Marvel comics, and Adam Warlock's return to the Marvel Universe gives us an indication into how it is their inner minds work, which actually work in a very warped way. They uh, have this uh, extremely kind of screwed up perspective on the universe. But we switch back to the conflict with uh, Thanos, who is now fighting against Namor the Submariner and She-Hulk. And what we see is that Thanos uh, physically punches both of them. He physically touches both of them. And when he does, some kind of growth begins to develop on them. And the growth begins to spread extremely fast. And what this is, is something that we're not explicitly told. They simply just seem to be covered in dirt or seem to be converting into dirt, indicating to us that maybe Thanos is either using the power gem to possibly hyper jump their evolution or is using the power gem to warp them into something else. But whatever it is that happens to take place here, Name of the Submariner and She-Hulk are effectively out of commission. They're no longer able to fight alongside the other superheroes. And this, again, is what we see being continued on with this discussion with Eros. Eros says that uh, the, the campaign that's going on here, the conflict that's, that's going on here, the way that things are being fought is Thanos' forte. This is Thanos uh, at his absolute peak, at his absolute best. He is really in full form here. And the reason why is because Thanos always does 
best when he's put into a circumstance where he has to use his intellect in conjunction with his power. And this is what we see Thanos doing. Thanos is more or less countering the attacks of various superheroes, but is doing it in such a way to where he has to think out what it is that they're going to do. From here, we see Thor and Doctor Doom continuing an attack on uh, Thanos. And again, Thor simply just throws his hammer. Eric Masterson throws his hammer into Thor or into uh, Thanos, and Thanos seems to be knocked down here. At this point, Doctor Doom goes to make a grab for the gauntlet. And again, this was the entire intention of Doctor Doom coming along here. Doctor Doom didn't really care about the survival of the universe, only in so far that he survived. His main goal here was to grab the Infinity Gauntlet, was to attain absolute power. But what we see as uh, as Doctor Doom attempts to grab the gauntlet is that Thanos is able to throw him off. Thanos is able to uh, to shoot him to the other side of the shrine as a uh, consequence of Doctor Doom trying to grab his gauntlet. At this point, we switch to uh, Thor, to uh, Eric Masterson, who is continuing to attempt to combat um, Thanos. But for the most part, he's just not very effective here. As Eric Masterson throws the uh, hammer of Thor towards Thanos, Thanos creates a portal and the uh, portal sends the hammer somewhere else. Now, we're not exactly sure where it sends it at the moment, but Eric Masterson begins to panic, and the reason why here is because if he does not reattain the hammer within 60 seconds, he'll turn back into his normal mortal form. He'll lose the form of Thor. And so we see him uh, saying that every moment has to be counted here, that he has to do everything he can to, uh, to punch Thanos. But as this conflict continues, as his assault on Thanos continues, we see that Thanos is slightly taken aback as Eros comments, but in the end, it doesn't really matter that Thanos is easily able to overpower Thor. And what he says is that this is a massive blow to the morale of the superheroes because this was a very high stakes card game and that Thor, due to his uh, vast power and the power that he has while wielding the hammer, was their ace in the hole. But because of the fact that Eric Masterson is so easily defeated by Thanos, it really shines a light on how little of a chance Chance the Earthbound superheroes have against fighting Thanos. At this point, we switch to Fire Lord, and Fire Lord is beginning his assault on Thanos, but again, this is simply just a distraction. And the distraction will, uh, for the most part, cost the life of, uh, of Fire Lord, but in return, we'll see that Wolverine is able to jump into action to attempt to destroy Thanos, to attempt to kill Thanos using his adamantium claws. But again, this doesn't really matter that much. This is just another instance of Thanos using his power. And what Thanos does is uh, more or less warp the mind or warp the body of a Wolverine, warp his adamantium skeleton. And what he does here is he changes the, the, the metal, the adamantium in his body into a rubbery material. And so Wolverine's bones are now rubber. His body is just simply not able to move. He has no real um, uh, solid form. And so Wolverine now is completely out of commission. At this point, we switch over to Doctor Doom, who is uh, attempting to again assault Thanos once more. He is starting his attack, and Thanos um, comments by asking Doctor Doom if he's attempting to take another shot at stealing his Infinity Gauntlet, and Doctor Doom says that only death will stay his hand, that only death will keep him from attempting to usurp Thanos' power, and Thanos simply says that can be arranged. At this point, we switch over to, uh, to Adam Warlock and the Silver Surfer, and Eternity has uh, made his presence known to Adam Warlock, saying that they grow restless, that the cosmic entities are ready to get involved in the conflict, but Adam Warlock simply sends him off and tells him that if he stays, that Thanos will sense his presence, and Thanos will be aware of the next step of the conflict. We also see that uh, Adam Warlock tells the Silver Surfer that to him, Eternity is no more of a piece on the chessboard than the other superheroes who are fighting, and Silver Surfer gets angry here that uh, Adam Warlock views this conflict is nothing more than a game, but what Adam Warlock says is that if he viewed this as anything other than a game, then he wouldn't be able to go on, just because the uh, the overall pressure, the consequences of what it would mean to fail would overwhelm him. At this point, we switch back to uh, Thanos as he's fighting uh, the Scarlet Witch and Cyclops, and again, we see Eros continuing to comment here, and Eros says that for the most part, the power of Cyclops and the Scarlet Witch are, again, really nothing compared 
compared to the power that Thanos has. And that Thanos, uh, weighing the options of the power that these individuals possess, chooses to go after the Scarlet Witch first. And he uses his powers to more or less override the ability that the Scarlet Witch has, to overcharge her powers, and to more or less, I guess, put her out of commission. At this point, he switches over to, uh, to Cyclops. And Cyclops, continuing to use his optic beams on Thanos, uh, that blasts him with a vast amount of power and then suddenly stops. And because he suddenly stops, Thanos is thrown off guard. Eros comments that this is a masterful move and that the basis of this was to throw Thanos off guard so that Tony Stark, Iron Man, could swoop in and deal a uh, energy shot to Thanos. But again, the power that, uh, that Iron Man has here is just not enough to really do anything against Thanos. It's just not enough to, uh, to do any real damage to Thanos, even while he's simply just using the power gem. And so what we see is that Taraxia jumps into the fray, and Taraxia uh, does what she can to physically defeat Iron Man. And we see that um, Cyclops goes back on the uh, offensive and begins blasting uh, uh, Thanos with his optic beams. But then Thanos uses his power. It appears as though he may be uh, cheating a little bit and using the reality gem, but he creates a glass uh, box around the head of Cyclops. And this does two things. The first thing that it does is, of course, it cuts off his optic beams. But the other thing it does is cut off the oxygen to him. We see Captain America running to his side as the Vision attempts to come up behind Thanos and uh, sneak attack him. But for the most part, Thanos, as is explained to us by Eros, never falls for the same trick twice. And so for the most part, what we see happening here is that Thanos is more or less punching a hole in, uh, in Vision, and Captain America in the background is trying to destroy the glass box over the head of Cyclops. But what we see is that as Vision is destroyed, uh, Thor, who was previously uh, knocked out into space by Thanos, is trying to uh, make his way back to the shrine. But as he gets back, the uh, the uh, the power wears off, the effect of Thor wears off, and so he switches back to his mortal form as Eric Masterson. And what we realize here, as again is explained to us by Eros, is that the spell that was used by Doctor Strange to make sure that these characters can breathe in space for 50, uh, 60 minutes appears to only apply to uh, Thor as he's wielding his hammer and not to the mortal form of Eric Masterson. And so Eric Masterson begins to suffocate. At this point, we switch back to Captain America. And Captain America tells us that Cyclops is dead, that Cy Cyclops had suffocated inside of the glass box. And Thanos uh, sort of laughs this off. He pokes fun at Captain America by saying this is an emotional outburst and is something that we, he would not have expected from the emotional or from the legendary Captain America. But what we also see taking place here is that Cloak is sneaking up behind Thanos in an attempt to ensnare him and trap him in the dark dimension. But we see that as uh, Cloak wraps his, uh, his cape around Thanos, that initially it seems as though he might be able to keep Thanos confined. That Thanos may, for the most part, be defeated and trapped inside the uh, the dark area that uh, that Cloak traps his foes in. But as we see, Thanos is not contained. That Thanos breaks out of the dark dimension and uh, appears to destroy Cloak in the process. At this point, Thanos declares that he cannot be imprisoned. That supremacy cannot be uh, imprisoned, and that his divinity is absolute. At this point, we see that again, the superheroes begin to go on the, the offensive against, um, against Thanos and his forces. We see that Taraxia is able to rip the head off of uh, Tony Stark, and that Draxa Destroyer attempts to defeat Thanos once more. And again, Thanos is displaying a vast amount of uh, bravado here, a vast amount of arrogance, but he also appears to be losing his mind entirely as the uh, power begins to continue to go to his head. And so what we see is is that Eros comments, uh, Eros said, simply says that everybody seems to know what's going on here. Everybody seems to recognize the insanity that Thanos is displaying here. That for the most part, he is so far removed from the Thanos who was peering into the Infinity Well and tracking down the Infinity Gems that any chance that he possibly had of gaining the, the affection of Mistress Death is for the most part entirely gone. But Eros also comments and says that the only person who doesn't really seem to care about what's going on 
on here with Thanos is Nebula. And again, Nebula, as she's uh, described to us by Eros, is more or less just kind of a, a caricature, more or less a husk of what used to be a person. She's simply just walking this line between life and death. And Eros goes as far as to say that she would be better off dead. From here, we switch to uh, Thor and uh, Eric Masterson as he is continuing to try to uh, pull the hammer towards himself. But the hammer, again, is simply just being teleported to a different location. But then we see the hammer lands in front of him. And when it does, when he does, as he's uh, momentarily approaching death, he picks up the hammer and is granted the power of Thor again. At this point, we see that uh, Thanos opens up a time portal and he sucks in Drax the Destroyer and Fire Lord, and they're sent back into the Earth's prehistoric period. But what we also see is that Taraxia is saying that she's managed to dispatch Iron Man, that she has killed Tony Stark more or less, as she's ripped the head off of his uh, of his shield, or I'm sorry, of his suit. We see that uh, that that Thanos says that uh, he loves a woman who shares his same values, who for the most part is a reflection of him. And it almost seems as though he's getting ready to say that she's a person he may come to love. But before he can speak, we see that Spider-Man shoots webbing in the face of, uh, of Thanos, which again is something a little bit funny here, a little bit of uh, entertainment to the dark nature of this story so far. And of course, Spider-Man swings in and we also see Quasar as well as uh, Thor arriving to attempt to defeat the forces of Thanos including Taraxia. But for the most part, again, this really isn't much of a conflict. Uh, Taraxia is able to subdue Spider-Man for the most part, and Thor, Eric Masterson, continues pummeling away at Thanos. He says that Thanos wiping out half the life in the universe is probably the worst act he thinks he could have committed, and that this is simply not something that can be allowed to pass. That Thor, that Eric Masterson, is going to use all of his power to try to kill Thanos, even if it means killing himself in the process. But what we see is that Thanos uses his Infinity Gauntlet to turn, to turn Thor into glass, into a solid piece of glass. And so again, we see this comment being made here, that finally people are starting to understand the realization of the truth, that for the most part, all is lost, that Thanos, using the power of the Infinity Gauntlet, could kill and eliminate all the forces of the Earthbound superheroes in any one of a thousand ways. And so for the most part, this battle again, was over before it even started. At this point, we see Nova arrive, and as Richard Ryder flies in, he simply tells uh, Thanos that this is not going to happen, that no one is going to destroy Thor as long as he is around. But then Thanos comments by saying square, not round, squares and cubes, and he simply converts, or I guess rematerializes uh, Nova into a series of children's blocks, again demonstrating to us the absolute power that Thanos uh, possesses here. At this point, we see Thanos destroy the uh, crystal form of Thor, and then we see Quasar stepping into the fray. And for the most part, Quasar was a character that we wouldn't necessarily have looked at as somebody that could single-handedly destroy Thanos, but given the power, the extreme energies that he's able to manipulate using the, uh, the quantum bands, that at the very least he would be able to put up some kind of a fight. But Thanos doesn't really uh, consider Quasar to be any one of any real significance. He simply looks at Quasar and refers to Quasar as the replacement for the lead Captain Marvel. And Quasar goes as far as to say that the quantum bands that he wields will be the downfall of Thanos, but almost immediately his quantum bands are destroyed by Thanos, and Quasar is for the most part rendered entirely useless. Thanos then uses his power to destroy Quasar entirely, to completely uh, disintegrate his body. And so now what we see is that for the most part, all these superheroes are totally out of commission. Wolverine's entire skeleton is made of a spongy material. The Vision has been destroyed by having his circuitry ripped out by Thanos. Um, Cyclops is suffocated, Spider-Man is unconscious, and Tony Stark has had his head ripped off. And so this again is more or less Thanos demonstrating to us that all hope is lost here, that there really isn't an instance where anybody can do anything. But what we see is that Captain America for the most part appears to be the last man standing. And Captain America simply tells Thanos that it's not over until it's over, that until all of the Earthbound heroes are dead, until there's no one left to fight Thanos, that there will always be somebody to pick up the mantle, and that for Captain America, he had always lived by the fact that for him, 
good will always triumph, that you have to fight until the end, even if the end means your certain death. But what we also see here is Adam Warlock telling the Silver Surfer to prepare himself, to get ready. And so we see that Captain America begins to uh, to advance onto Thanos, and to more or less, despite the fact that he's vastly outpowered by Thanos, to refuse to accept defeat, to more or less tell Thanos that he's going to do everything he can to attempt to stop him. And what, what, uh, what Captain America says here again is that as long as one man stands, Thanos will never be able to claim victory. But Thanos says that these are notable, noble sentiments, that these are noble sentiments from a person who's about to be killed. We see that um, Silver Surfer says that Thanos is going to kill Captain America, and so he has to intervene, but Adam Warlock says to wait. Captain America replies to Thanos by saying that he's always held these sentiments, that he's always believed that one man can make the difference between absolute defeat and absolute victory. And so these words, these uh, this creed that he has is a creed worth dying for. And Thanos simply replies by saying, then he shall die for these words. And he simply destroys his, uh, his shield by smacking it. At this point, we see that as he's getting ready to deal the killing blow to uh, Captain America, we see that, uh, that Adam Warlock yells at Silver Surfer to run, to move as fast as he can. And so we see Silver Surfer using all of his energy to travel as fast as he possibly can across the cosmos to where Thanos is at. And in almost the blink of an eye, uh, Silver Surfer has arrived at his location. And what we see is that the goal of Silver Surfer here is to snatch the Infinity Gauntlet off the hand of Thanos as he's getting ready to kill Captain America. But at the very last second, we see that Thanos realizes what it is that the Silver Surfer is trying to do and is able to keep his Infinity Gauntlet from being stolen. At this point, Thanos begins to come to, he begins to regain his senses, regain his sanity, and he realizes that he's been a fool here, that he has allowed the words of Mephisto to more or less override his uh, logic, override his reason, and so he more or less reverts back to the old Thanos that we knew, where he would go into conflict with uh, with an inset, with a, um, I guess a logic, with a, uh, a solid mindset in terms of how best to defeat his opponents, and so what he says is that he almost lost it all due to his arrogance, due to his insanity, he almost lost the Infinity Gauntlet. And so he wills himself back to full power. He wills himself back to being able to manipulate all of the power that the Infinity Gauntlet possesses. And so the first thing we see him do is say that he wills himself to clear the entire battlefield of everything that's there, to clear the entire battlefield of all the dead bodies and all the destruction, because what's coming is going to be a far greater struggle than what he's just been through. Adam Warlock begins to comment and say that they tried to do it the easy way and they failed. And so now the conflict is coming that he tried to avoid. The conflict is coming that he didn't want to have because it's a conflict that the universe may not survive and so he calls on eternity and the rest of the cosmic entities. From here, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end, and what we're going to see in the next video is this continued discussion where we see the cosmic entities beginning to uh, lay on the offensive towards Thanos and doing the best they can to oppose Thanos while he's holding the Infinity Gauntlet. And what we'll see as this story progresses is again that Nebula will become the most important character. She will immediately come to the limelight as the single most important character in the Infinity Gauntlet event as we continue. With that being said, I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.